You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy, starting now. All right. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I am David George Brooke, your host, where my mission is to have guests that relate and recall moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect a deeper dive into gratitude's immense power, a gratitude tip of the show, or maybe a gratitude nugget. Also, how you can become a gratitude believer and maybe one or two or three takeaways from today's show. My podcast is available every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. It is downloaded on the Transformation Talk radio network and is available on Apple, Spotify, Google, and a number of other places where podcasts are available. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I appreciate that. And also to purchase a gratitude journal. A lot of people ask me about that or to find out more about my gratitude speaking, individual or group coaching. You can connect with me at thatgratitudeguy.com. And you can also see in the background thatgratitudeguypodcast.com as well. So let me get on to the favorite part of my show, which is my guest. My guest today is Susan McConnell. Let me tell you a little bit about Susan. Susan is the executive director for Wesley Homeless Foundation, where she has served for almost two years. Prior to joining Wesley Home, Susan was president and CEO of Make-A-Wish of Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana, the largest chapter in the country where she served for 18 years. Susan is originally from Seattle, Washington, and spent the first decade of her nonprofit career working for Poncho and Make-A-Wish of Washington State. Susan's passions are her family, work, her dog Maisie, reading, and working on the potter's wheel. Susan, welcome to the podcast. (laughs) Thank you, David. It's good to be here. Good to have you and always nice to learn something new, the potter's wheel. We'll get to that later. So wasn't sure about that. But I always start off with the show, uh, whether people are interested or not, uh, to tell people the context of my guests. So tell the listeners how you and I met. Well, we have a mutual friend and his name is Mark Davis. And one day I got a phone call from him and I said uh, my uh, exuberant hello. And I was on a speakerphone, as I recall. And he said, I have someone I want you to meet. And there you were on the other line. And so uh, we ended up getting together. But Mark is a wonderful friend and a great connector of people. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I remember too, and I'll use you as an example on the very positive when you meet somebody. I've said this, I say this occasionally with podcast guests is that I'm just always fascinated by when you meet somebody, David, Susan, Susan, David, and you either really like the person right away, or it's not that you don't like them. You just don't feel the same connection. And I've met people before that I just, what'd you think of my friend? I go, well, yeah, they were okay. You know, they just, there's just yeah. not a connection. I remember what I said, so we hang up. I go, who's that? Where did you meet Susan McConnell? Oh my God. <laughs> is that, is, I'm trying to match her energy for energy, step for step. So, but, but as I was reading that bio, I was thinking if we kind of go back, I like to kind of go back, figure out how we met, but also way before that, it just seems to me that a lot of your journey uh, in your professional life has been around different charitable organizations, certainly make a wish and then later Wesley, but kind of start and just take us back a little bit back to where you started and how you kind of, I don't know, back to college, but maybe how you got on that journey, especially with make a wish. And if that was something you sort of planned and we talk about being grateful for things and having gratitude, but it was something that happened organically or how did that come about? Well, uh, I was an arts major and uh, I went to college in New York and uh, I was a dancer And uh, when I got married and had my kids, I came back to the Pacific Northwest and um, decided to do some work in the arts since I knew a lot about them. And I ended up working for Poncho. And that was really a result of uh, friends giving me introductions. And I'd never worked for a nonprofit before. So I started at the bottom and I was a a, a administrative assistant answering the phone and uh, doing a lot of data entry and just, well, pretty much everything they needed. (laughs) And I learned a lot. And when you have a small office with a small staff, uh, the best way to learn about nonprofits is to volunteer for everything. Raise your hand. I'll do it. I'll do it. And uh, and it was it was fun because, as you said, I do have a lot of energy, uh, as do you. And uh, so I wanted to just 
eat it up. And, and I did. And, and I just love the arts. I, I think they're food for my soul. Uh, they make me happy. And uh, so I uh, devoted myself to that organization for seven years, but I also um, had another child during that time period. So I was able to work part-time. So they were very accommodating to my schedule. And then I was at a dinner party and I met uh, the newly hired executive director of the Make-A-Wish Foundation for Washington State. And he was just delightful. And we were just got to talking and he uh, called me two weeks later and said, I have a job that you might be interested in. And, you know, being creative and loving children was just, you know, something that I couldn't refuse. And so he hired me to be their very first paid wish coordinator. Wow. What a job. Yeah, I was a wish coordinator. So I got to work with children and their families and, um, and, and help them uh, grant their wishes. And uh, when you do that sort of thing, you also involve volunteers and you involve the community and you, you make that circle of giving larger and larger around that child and family. And so it becomes a real uh, important uh, kind of a, a giving culture to the whole community that's surrounding that child. It gives a lot of hope even to the medical professionals that are helping the child go through their cancer or, or whatever else they have, uh, because it's something to look forward to. Mm -hmm. And so I enjoyed that very much. And I, I worked there for uh, six and a half years. And then I w went moved to Ohio. And in Ohio, uh, when our national make wish of America found out that I had moved, they called me and asked if I would start a single person office. They had no local presence in Columbus, Ohio. Mm. And uh, I said, all right. And so I really feel very grateful that I never <laughs> looked for a job. They kind of kept falling in my lap. Uh, which I'm incredibly grateful for and um, uh, feel incredibly fortunate to have happened. So I started a single person office and with a brand like the Make-A-Wish Foundation, uh, I had people answering my phone calls right away and I did outreach into the hospitals and I was able to get volunteers involved and I was able to get funders involved and uh, it was a lot of people uh, signing up right away to help promote this. and. We grew it to be the largest chapter in the country because I ended up doing five mergers and acquisitions with the state of Kentucky, the state of Indiana, the Cleveland area, which had a small chapter at the time, and uh, even, even Toledo, which had a small chapter. So we were a tri-state chapter, and I was their CEO. I was there 18 years, and I, I just, I loved it. I loved the growth. I loved the people. Uh, I love all the children I got to help and the families. And, you know, I'll, tell, I'll take a step back really quick because I got a phone call just about a month ago from a father of a young man that I had worked on his wish in 1997. Wow. And he called me to tell me he thought of me the other day because he saw pictures of his son's wish and it reminded him and he just wanted to see how I was doing. And uh, these are lifelong friends, the people you meet and, and you get really um, very close to all of them. So uh, I, I feel, again, very fortunate and grateful that I've had those relationships. Um, but I am from Seattle, as you mentioned in my brief bio, and uh, my children grew up and moved back to the Seattle area and are married and I knew there'd be babies coming. And so I decided it was time for me to come back home as well. So this is the first time I actually looked for work and um, I met Kevin Anderson, the CEO of Wesley. And uh, he's just a wonderful man. And uh, we hit it off well and I became the executive director of their, their foundation. And my bio is a little out of date because I've been here almost 10 years, not two. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I should have updated that for you. That's my fault. And so I've, uh, I really enjoyed the work. So I've worked with the arts, I worked with children, and now I'm working with seniors. So I have devoted my entire career to helping other people, which actually helps me a lot too. That's great. Yeah, that's absolutely true. One of the things I talk about in my talks, if you want to help yourself, help other people. And so, that's but right. that's interesting, kids, the arts and seniors and so on. And I want to just go back. I've got a couple of questions sort of going back chronologically. How long were you with Poncho way back when? About six years. Mm -hmm. six, oh, I think you Maybe six almost years. seven, actually, I'd have to look, but I think, I think close to seven, but I had a little bit of part-timer there when I had a child. <laughs> well, the reason I ask is because I think back on, I was running a fancy men's clothing store in 74 mm -hmm. to 84. And mm -hmm. I just remember hearing all about Poncho and, and making donations mm -hmm. and so forth. But I think the thing that struck me the most, and I just am curious with you, I just couldn't believe the people I met that were involved in Poncho because they were kind of the who's who 
of Seattle yeah. in the yeah. I don't, captains and whatever the female version of captains is of industry. Um, just mm-hmm. some impress. I met you must have met some amazing people. Oh, I did. They were the people that built Seattle. Mm-hmm. That you know the Bankies, the Skinners, the the Freitags. I mean, they just the- they uh, yeah they they were and they were very kind to me and they appreciated my work and uh, they were devoted to the arts and as well as many many other causes all over mm-hmm. uh, the place. But yeah, it was a great way to learn about. Uh, working with uh, board members and uh, mm-hmm. very high influential people, uh, as well as um, helping do some good work for the arts and the arts struggle, you know, they're struggling right now. And, yeah. uh, but I think, again, arts really are important to um, the, everyone, our culture. Yeah. We yeah. Need so I'm so very important. And I know it's struggling right now. Of course, many things are struggling, but I right. think the arts have really gotten the short end of the stick as well. You know, hearing yeah. you say that about uh, some of those family members and this thinking back to this clothing store, uh, it reminds me of a story that it was always interesting to me about people's re- ver- you know version of themselves or view of themselves, I should say self-esteem. There was a clothing, uh, there was a, a coffee uh, company was like Tully's or Starbucks or something. And inside there was, it was a fourth in union and there was a shoe shine guy. He had two, two chairs there. So I'd go get my shoe shine there. And, you know, it was a couple of bucks or whatever it was. And I just talked to him and he was really nice. And he was just a really cool, older African-American gentleman. And I always said, I don't know what I got more of a shine on my shoes or my brain, because he just always had the most <laughs> incredible things to say. But one day I looked to my right and here's all the pictures, the same people you're talking about. And it's mm-hmm. all the names of Charlie Roy or Norm Rice and, and Ben Arroyo right. and all these names, again, the captain's ministry, same people are very involved in Poncho. And he, and he looks at me and he says, oh, I see you're looking at those are all the people that get their shoe shine here. And he goes, you know what they all have in common? And uh, I went, no, let me guess. And so I started guessing powerful and successful and money. And he kept going, no, no. And I must have rattled off 10 or 12 different uh, characteristics. And he goes, no, the answer is they never talk about themselves. And I just, I just wow. thought that was so incredible because I noticed that at the clothing store, they were worried about poncho and how, what we can do. And we're going to make a donation and we're going to do clothes or whatever it might be. But, but it, mm-hmm. that ended up being really true. And I found over time, of course, here I am interviewing people for the podcast, but I want them to talk about themselves, but it was just so interesting that these people didn't just spout off like so many people do. Let me tell you more about me. And, and I thought right. maybe that had something to do with their charitable aspect and being comfortable in who they are. But I also thought that was such a cool aspect of those people. So, but mm-hmm. moving on past Poncho, wish coordinator. So there is your title. And the thing that I'm curious about is that you, and I don't know, I don't think as well, as well as I know you've ever asked you this, but there has to be this piece where not everybody could have their wish granted. So how did that part figure into like, here are these people called you, you did my wish back in 1997 and we never forgot it. How did it work with the people? Is it just, you try to make as many wishes that you can come true? Is there only so much within the budget? How did that piece work within make a wish? Well, the good news is that if a child qualified for a wish and we worked through the doctors and hospitals on that, they got their wish. Mm. And if I had to go out and pound the pavement for a sponsor, then, then we would do that. It's very, very difficult for people to say no uh, to somebody with a sense of urgency about, about a child. So I can tell you for a fact that uh, the only time kids wouldn't get a specific wish is if it maybe was something that we just simply couldn't do, like go to the moon, you know, oh, but okay. could we replicate that? You mm-hmm. know, um, I had a little girl once who wanted to go to see uh, Home Alone 2, the movie Home Alone 2, but she was at Fred Hutch and she was uh, just had a bone marrow transplant and she was in isolation and she was not doing well. And so they would not let her out. So she could not go to the movie. Now, this movie had not been released yet. Oh, so wow. I contacted the um, producers in the company and they sent a gentleman up from LA. Well, and in those days, <laughs> they put the VCR tape in of a, of, it was like a briefcase and it was handcuffed to his wrist oh, and wow. he flew up on Alaska Airlines and came into the hospital and he they put the video in so she got a preview of Home Alone 2 and then after it was over he made a phone call and the two actors uh, talked to her on the phone oh. um, those are the good old days you know before you had um, you know zoom and so forth mm-hmm. uh, but so there is, there are ways to make a wish happen if you can't do exactly what the child really would like, uh, but uh, we do, we did try, and uh, I really feel good about it. And the only times I didn't feel good about it is if a child actually died before we were able to accomplish the wish. 
So, no. and that was, that was always hard. That was pretty much out of our control too. And I imagine that happened from time to time. It did. Yeah. 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 Interesting. So uh, when you were in, and how about with, with make a wish from the original, the original, the, Now the, now the video comes on. Hold on, sorry. Jiminy. Uh, and I think about Make-A-Wish, what was the gentleman's name that started it? Oh, you know, I, I have to be, I'm so embarrassed. I don't even remember his name, but he was, oh, Tommy Austin. Yes, Tommy yeah. Austin. And he yeah. was a, um, uh, one of the, uh, he was a policeman, but he was um, a motorcycle uh, cop. So he mm -hmm. was, you know, that that's what this little boy liked. Chris was the little, the first child and he just loved motorcycles. And so Tommy Austin helped him become um, a, um, a motorcycle policeman and they got him a uniform and everything. Oh, yeah. wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So when you went from the, this is interesting to me, uh, a, a single person office, gee, we've all just got all sorts of buzzing going on today. Um, when you went from a single person office to a tri-state uh, operation and you said you really enjoyed it but I have to imagine wasn't it kind of a challenge with some of the growing pains in terms of starting out no matter how many good people you found to go from a single person office to a tri-state operation that's kind of going from small potatoes to like a corporation was that a challenge over the years oh yes <laughs> it was a big challenge and there were a lot of growing pains and uh you know, it's, it took a toll on me and my team. I had a really great group of people that were all from basically from corporate America. And um, we had, when we were looking for a CFO, we were looking for a COO, you know, we really, um, myself and my board really tried to look for people that had had a lot of experience with, with uh, corporate America because they would know how to help us grow uh, more effectively, we thought, and it did, it did pan out that way. So, uh, so we had this core team that helped with all the transition, but, you know, when you're looking at uh, a company like the Make-A-Wish Foundation, it, it is a charity. They are people who care deeply about children and they're there because they love kids and they love what the mission is. So things, um, when you're merging, there's, a, there's often a sense of loss and uh, a, a sense of, are we being taken over? Are you gonna listen to us anymore? And so making sure everyone felt included in this process and, and making sure that every staff member from, from one of the offices knew they would have a guaranteed job, that we were not changing that. The whole board of directors in, in Indiana were not gonna lose their, um, you know, their, their board positions was vitally important to the success of, of the organization, but also for them. You know, I think they all needed to uh, feel like they were still very important and part of the organization. And, and we tried very hard to do that. And I think we succeeded, uh, but it's still, it, I got a little bruised from time to time. <laughs> I would think, I would think too, when you mention merging and a sense of loss, when it starts from a small operation and gets bigger and bigger, one of the reasons why M&A mergers and acquisitions and people are in that business is they're always hoping to expand the business by twice and have the sales quadruple or whatever the number is. There's a bigger reason why they do mergers and acquisitions. Right. What mm -hmm. were some of the benefits of, of going from that single person to the tri-state or getting bigger? What, was it yeah. as easy as figuring out there was more kids that could be helped? Well, that's part of it. Uh, when, when you look at it, so when I was in Ohio and Kentucky and then Indiana um, was a chapter all by itself and that, that chapter basically ran out of money and they didn't have the staff there that knew really how to raise it and outside of special events, which was not sustainable. So they were, had gone through their resources and they, they didn't have enough money to even support the children. And so the, uh, our national organization really took a, a, dive, a deep dive and then looked at us and they asked if we would take them on. And so there's an efficiency of scale when you're looking at these things. So you can still have that office, but then if a child's going say to Disney World from Indianapolis or a child's going to Disney World from Columbus, Ohio, it really shouldn't cost that much more. It should be pretty much the same, maybe a little bit here and there with the airfare and so forth. But 
but there was big discrepancies. And so we were able to clean that up. And then in terms of just everything you order from supplies to, you know, brochures, you know, you have leverage of, of numbers when you have a larger organization, uh, but yet you want to keep the individuality uh, of the organization too, because every donor that I talked to, there's very few, there were a few that didn't mind if their uh, support went more global, but most donors wanted their money to stay in their own backyard and help oh, kids yeah. in their own backyard. Mm -hmm. And so we had to make sure that that happened. So there was a lot of that where we're going to keep the individuality of, the, of each um, office, but we also needed to be a little more global and, and be more um, uh, supportive with all of the in intricacies of ordering and, and you, you know, just helping. Now, we had one accounts payable person instead of five. Oh, wow. You know, we had one ops person instead of five. You know, we, we could, there was economies of scale with having uh, one corporate office, but they had the experience being from a corporation in the past to actually leverage their skills, you know, to, mm -hmm. to support that many offices. And for them, that was something they were used to doing. And so it wasn't that difficult, but um, the difficulty always, in my opinion, comes down to personalities yeah. and to the people. And um, they want to make I mean, every at the end of the day, I think everyone just wants to know they'll be OK and their kids will be taken care of. And um, we made sure that happened. But wow. there was an economy of scale. We saved a lot of money. And we also I, I believe we were kind of the tail wagging the dog. And what I mean by that is we were the model chapter that other chapters over time. Um, our national organization then did a lot more mergers and um, helped other chapters become a little bit more like us because it just made more sense and it, mm -hmm. it, it was more efficient, but yet okay. kept the individuality intact. And you mentioned personalities and I've always thought it's interesting back to when I said you meet people and you instantly like them or instantly it just doesn't have that much of a connection. And I've always thought personality is one of those things that falls into the category like work ethic and other things. You can't really teach it. If you don't have a personality, you take a class called personality 101. And then when you finish the <laughs> class, you have a great personality and they're just right, they're doesn't work. <laughs> people. It's like when I first met you and I go, where does she get that personality? Holy oh cow. It's so energetic <laughs> and so forth. And so yeah. it's just, it's interesting, but melding that's what, again, from the single person office to tri state and the size of that. And I've mentioned in the past working, managing a big Nordstrom store. It's just so fascinating how you have to figure out all these gears to mesh. Yes. And every time you add new people to the mix, it's another gear that has to sort of mesh with everybody else and and sometimes mm -hmm. it works and sometimes it's not as as uh, successful but but you mentioned a couple of times grateful and i always like to ask my guests too so how has i, I love you i've always loved your attitude as you know and and how has gratitude kind of played a part in your life whether it was personally or professionally well i think sometimes when you're young you don't realize um how gratitude plays a lot plays a role unless you have family or friends model that, uh, you, mm -hmm. you know, you kind of take things for granted. Um, but I, uh, I look back now and I'm incredibly grateful that I grew up in a very simple household. I mean, we didn't have a lot of money and uh, we never knew that. <laughs> we just had fun <laughs> and there's lots of music and I had parents that were very attentive and sisters and brother that, you know, we just, we enjoyed each other. And, mm -hmm. um, so I look back now and I'm incredibly grateful for that. You know, we did not have video games, <laughs> we didn't have computers or cell phones. I mean, that's, we're just at that age where we just didn't have that growing up. Uh, but I am grateful for the simplicity and, and yet somehow the complexity of those relationships. Uh, you know, going into where I am now today, um, I mean, having been through a lot of life, I, uh, I'm grateful to be here. Yeah. Uh, I'm grateful that I can take a deep rest every morning and um, center myself for the day mm -hmm. uh, because uh, I have had my share of health issues and I'm very grateful to be uh, over those, but also mindful that I have to maintain a healthy lifestyle to stay healthy. Such and um, my gosh, I'm grateful more than anything for the nurses that held my hand and took care of me. Mm -hmm. I mean, the doctors did their job, but the nurses had the care and compassion. So I don't know. I think about those kind of things a lot. And I'm grateful for my friends, of course. I mean, I just my friends and family are just, I mean, what's life without friends and family? I mean, I'm a social person and I need them. So <laughs> I hope they feel the same way about me. <laughs> well, and, it, and it's so important too, because I think I recently had a, I think it was a question from the audience or something. Can you be grateful when you're grieving? 
And I said, yes. I mean, gratitude doesn't come and go with the, the ups and downs of your life. It's always there. It, what you might be grateful for might be shifting. And just for the nurses holding your hand as an example, that's such a great example. The doctors that yeah. did it, but there's the nurses that got you through it and so forth, the different health challenges that you've had. And I just find it so interesting because I, I've said to people, sometimes it's as basic as I got to sleep in a warm bed. I got to have a hot shower today. I have a roof over my head. I got a meal. I got to go buy a coffee at Starbucks or something. And some people don't have that. And so it's just so important and there's all levels of it. And, but it also, I always wonder where things come from and I'm in things like, where does the motivation come from? Where's the inspiration come from? If I look back on your career, Susan, one of the things I see is in three or four different areas, is this real sense of giving and being a giving person. And, and if you look back on your life, where do, where do you kind of think that mindset came from? You know, I, I, I don't really know. I, I wish I had a better answer for you. Um, my family was very generous, but again, it wasn't in monetary forms because we didn't have money, but they were very giving in terms of teaching. And there was always room to set another plate at the table for anyone that wanted to eat with us, you know, mm. and we included people. Well, my father was a professor at PLU, so we always had students coming by and staying with us and who had needed to stay for maybe the holidays because they couldn't go home or something. And so for, for me, it was just always, there's always room for more. Mm. Uh, there's always room to be kind to somebody and just, they were part of our family and they were therefore included in the circle of love and life with that, that, that I was part of. And so um, I don't know, I, I really feel that if it's just part of me. It's not that it's a good way to be or a bad way to be. It's just part of me that I like to help people and I, I'm of service. And to me, that makes me whole. Yeah. So I, I need to be that way. I could not do anything else. It just wouldn't fulfill me. And having said that, I do like time off <laughs> to take care of myself. <laughs> and I do get selfish with reading a book or, you know, just doing something on my own to replenish and recharge my battery. So I'm not totally Mother Teresa, don't get me wrong. <laughs> somebody, I was, on a, I was on a Zoom call yesterday, a mastermind group, and, and somebody said something, they were talking about uh, different ways to make sure you have good self-care. But she said right. something, and that's, it's, that calls for extreme self-care. And I've never heard those yeah. two words together, extreme and self-care. I said, oh, that makes sense. And, and when you really need to go back, and it's much beyond the massage and the pedicure or the manicure, something like that. And I thought that was kind of yeah. cool. But, but And sometimes yeah. another thing I've sort of felt as I've gotten older is that a lot of times there is an answer to some of the questions that I ask or somebody else might ask. But I'm also becoming a lot more comfortable with the answer being, I don't know. Because it's, yeah. it's, I've always been curious, like, you know, I've commented several times on your personality. Where does that come from? Is it from your mom? Is it from your dad? Is it from a professor, a teacher, a, a mentor, somebody? And sometimes I think it's just there. And I, I've it's mentioned there. our energy and I'm very energetic. And I don't know where my, you know, my dad had a good work mm -hmm. ethic. My mom had a big personality, but you know, you, you just, I've got one brother that doesn't have any energy at all. So it's like, it's always, mm -hmm. you kind of wonder where those things come from, but, but I want to, um, I'm going to wrap up in about five minutes, but I want to go back a little bit. And I want to talk about sort of three areas that you dealt with. And, and I'd like to know kind of the best part of each one of these three. And the first one, what was the best part of being around the arts? Mm. Well, I think the best part of being around the arts was just being part of them, watching a show, you know, going to a ballet performance and just being swept off my feet. Or um, I recently just heard a piano and violin concert and uh, I realized in that moment, I missed it so much, live music so much. Yeah. I just could hardly speak after it was over. As it's with the pandemic, I hadn't been to anything. And so just to, to be around a real artist who knows their craft and, and to have them give and, and to be able to receive that gift, it's just so moving. Um, so I, I love that. I'm the creative people and inspire me. I hope I'm, I can be creative as well. Um, but yeah, I just... It just moves me. I love it. Um, yeah. So I hope that's a good answer for you. If that's, that's what you're looking for. But I just, yeah. And, and that segues right into the next group, and that's working with children. What was the best part of working with children? You know, one of the things I love the best about it, and, I, and images just flicker in my head as soon as you say that, uh, so many children that were desperate. But really the parents. The mm -hmm. parents were more desperate. And for me to be able to relieve them a little tiny bit because I have children and I can't even imagine being in their shoes. I don't want to imagine being in their shoes. But I remember once, um, because you know, Fred Hutch, 
uh, they do a lot of bone marrow transplants for people all over the world. So we would get children from everywhere. And I remember this uh, couple from Italy and they couldn't speak English at all. And we were trying to talk to them about a wish and uh, they did not believe me that we would do this. They thought there was a catch. So I pulled out of my wallet, my two kids pictures and they were just little ones. They were like four and six. And as soon as they saw them, they said, oh, you know, you're bambinos. I said, yes, they trusted me. Wow. And we were able to work with their children. And so I think that connection with a parent that's going through so much and being able to help them have a break and a breather and enjoy a laugh, a laugh with their child or see their child's eyes light up. That, that was the best thing of all. Oh, the best cool. thing. And it was hard for people to say no when I could convey that message about what we were trying to do. Yeah. For a child. And- and, it, and so many children that are desperate. And I really like when you mentioned the parents, because I think both you and I are parents. And yeah. it's a subject you don't even like to talk about, so I shouldn't even bring it up. But just the thought passing through your head that something would happen to one of our children, yours or mine, yeah. is just like, excuse me, let's move on to something else, please. And you just don't know that until you become a parent. And right. I look at a handful of, yeah, and I have a handful of people and friends in my life that aren't parents. And, you know, they're never going to get to experience what it's like to be a father or a mother. And the right. connection that you have there, you love somebody so much more, or even beyond anything you can imagine. It's just, uh, I, I get emotional just talking about it too. So, um, but that's, and then that leads into the third one. And that's, what's the best thing about working with seniors? You know, I didn't know I would love it this much, but I do. I, I love learning from seniors who have so much life experience and are so thoughtful. And most of, most of the people I work with uh, are incredible listeners and uh, love to connect with me. And I love to connect with them. Uh, there's a kindness. There's a gentleness uh, going into the final you know, few years of their life. Uh, they're grateful to be here every day. Uh, I, I work with people that are dealing with tremendous health issues, mm. tremendous uh, that are that are causing them to look you know deaf in the face, and they are happy, and they still smile, and they have positive attitudes, and their glasses are half full, and I learned a lot from that, and so I guess you know they people. They just care about life still. They care about living and they're going to do it till the very last minute. You know, there's this little gal that lives down the hall from my office because I kind of live in, uh, my office is in this community and um, she is 94 and her name is Wilda. <laughs> I love her name. And one of the best parts of my week is when Wilda walks down the hall and makes a batch of brownies in this community kitchen and she doesn't oh, share wow. them by the way, but I get to smell them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I just think, my goodness, how cool is that? She still likes to bake brownies and smell them and oh, you know, that's cool. that's tease cool. me with them. But <laughs> you know, I don't know. They just, uh, they, I, they're just wonderful people. And I, and I hopefully will be them. Yeah. They are us and we are them. And there's really no difference except a couple decades, maybe three decades so, and, in some cases. <laughs> and, and it's interesting for me to hear that as it kind of, again, the progression from the arts and the aspect of that through children, through seniors, and you've right. kind of hit on some pretty different major groups in our world, if you will. And so uh, a couple last questions. What if somebody said, gosh, Susan, I really respect your path in life, somebody that was you could mentor that would want to be mentored, and says, I just like the journey that you've taken on, on in your life. And here I am, and I'm 18, or I'm 20, or whatever. What's one tip that you might give them as something that maybe would be helpful to them? Well, if they're 18, then I'm gonna tell them to educate themselves in whatever way will keep them in college to finish. Mm. Uh, So I don't care if it's in communications or engineering or math or uh, foreign language, or it doesn't really matter. It's about growing up and and it's about getting more life experience because if you wanna work in nonprofits, to be good in nonprofits, you do need a lot of life experience. Yeah. You know, you need to be able to talk to just about anybody and relate to just about anybody and and listen really well. So uh, I, I always have uh, shared with young people who do come talk to me, it, it really just finish school. And it doesn't matter what degree you have because the most important qualities are being able to communicate, talking and writing. And, and if that, if you can do that, you can work in nonprofits. And then I sh- ask them to think about what kind of passion do they have? Is it animals? Is it people? Is it children? Is it healthcare? 
you know, there's so many wonderful causes out there and uh, whatever is really, you feel your heart stir and then that's where you should gravitate. So that's what that's I try excellent. to tell them. That's excellent. And that segues nicely into my last question. Before I get to my last question, though, I want to just sum up a couple of the takeaways that I have. And you just kind of summed it up really nicely is certainly listen, I think is amazing. I remember Larry King, the broadcaster, said once that they asked him after 30 or 40 years on the radio, what, what's the biggest thing you learn? And he says, you can't learn anything when you're talking and you can ask <laughs> good questions and then really, really listen. You can always tell when somebody listens because you can tell sometimes they can't ask the next question unless they hear what you just said. And so many people Correct. are so busy trying to insert themselves in the conversation, communicate number two, which is something that can probably never be over uh, emphasized. It's so important. Finish school, right. tremendous tip. And then what kind of passion do you have? And where's your heart too, which is really in it. So those are some great takeaways. I also really like that so many children are desperate to understand the parents are desperate. So you come across somebody with a, a child that's in some sort of need or whatever, focus on the child, but maybe focus even more on the parents because they're the ones that are going through that. And, and we, as mm -hmm. we just said, we know that's going to be difficult. So, so my last mm -hmm. question, it kind of ties in a little bit to what you just said, but I'm thinking of Susan specifically. And that is if you got to pick one thing that you know now at your age, you would have liked to have known at 18 that would have helped you, what would that be? Hmm. It's really hard to go back, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, I think um, I think I would, to, to be honest, this is terrible, but I think I would have stayed single longer. <laughs> mm -hmm. I just think I just had um, more to give and more exploring to do with myself and relationships take time and energy. And I do love my relationships. Don't get me wrong. Um, I've been married twice and great people I have two wonderful children, um, but I, I probably would have stayed single a little bit longer if I had to do anything over again, but that's, that's really kind of, you kind of laugh, but I kind of think that's good. I know I, I got married at 21 and a half and, and yeah. my, my younger son is 27 now and he's, he's got a girlfriend that's pretty solid. And so they may get together at some point, but that's getting close to 30. My older son is 37. Yeah. He got married at about, yeah. I think 33 or something. So I think that's really a good tip in many ways, because really how well do you know yourself? In fact, I think if somebody gave me a range, just my opinion, I'd say, I don't know, mid twenties to, to maybe late twenties or early thirties is probably a pretty good right. range because it takes you a while to figure yourself out. So I think that's a it really does. good, I think that's a yeah, good tip. So that's excellent. But then well, it all leads to the present moment. I mean, you know, exactly. I have two great kids and so it exactly. is good. It's all good. Exactly. So, well, thank you so much. That was, and that is that for that is it for this episode, everyone. A couple of final reminders. There were some great takeaways that Susan had, which I just mentioned. And once again, my podcast is available every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. on the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, Google, and so forth. And as I mentioned earlier, please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. To purchase a gratitude journal or find out more about my gratitude speaking, coaching, group coaching, or one-on-one -on -one coaching, you can connect with me at that gratitude guy. Also, a lot of people like to receive the Monday morning minute. I send out a 60 second video every Monday morning to kind of start your week off on the right foot. And you go to your text and you go in your text number and text 22828. That's 22828. And in the message box, type in gratitude guy, all one word, and then that will connect you to send your email and you'll get the Monday morning minute. And also as an exclusive for my podcast listeners, I'm offering my three month uh, proprietary gratitude coaching program with two extra months included. If you've heard about it on the podcast, so you can get a hold of me, as I mentioned from uh, at David at thatgratitudeguy.com. So finally, thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate you, the listeners, so much. I appreciate my guest, Susan. I am David George Brooke, That Gratitude. And as I always finish off, remember, be grateful and never quit. So long. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us, and you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.